So this, this morning, I want to bring to you a message that, I'm, that I titled, All to Jesus, I Surrender. Okay. Who am I? What am I doing here? What does God want from me? How we answer these questions shape who we are. Pastor and writer David Kaywood suggests that there are five things that shape our identity. Our past, our, that's our life experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All those things have an impact on how we see ourselves and how, what we perceive our place in the world to be. Our people, the people that we choose to spend time with influence how we see ourselves among our tribe. What is your tribe? You know, what is that circle of people that, that you hang with, that you identify with, that shape who you are and form your, your priorities, those sorts of things? Our people are a big influencer on our identity, aren't they? Our personality. This is the combination of the gifts that God has given us. It's our, our temperament and our attitude or attitudes. How our personality our personality shapes the next factor, which is our purpose. And it determines how we approach life and our relationships. So that fourth element, our purpose, is what we perceive to be our purpose in this life, our reason for being. And one of the most imp it is one of the most powerful influencers of our identity. Think of it, when you meet somebody new for the first time, very often, what's one of the first questions you ask them? What do you do? What do you do? Because you know? what we do is linked to what we think our purpose is, right? And then finally, our priorities. We'll always make time for the things that we value the most. What we do in our free time and how we spend our, di our discretionary income tells us what our priorities are. We can get a pretty good sense of a person's priorities by looking at how they spend their money and how they spend their time because those are the two most valuable commodities that each one of us have right the apostle paul's identity found in romans 1 1 paul kind of gives us a summary of all these things in his opening to the letter of the church at rome when he said this paul a bond servant of jesus christ called to be an apostle and separated to the gospel of God. And there are three things that Paul uses to describe himself in this, the salutation of this letter. First, he says, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I'm called to be an apostle. And I am set apart for the gospel of God. There's a lot to unpack in each one of these statements. The first five aspects of a person's identity that that I talked about earlier can be seen in these three simple statements. And we're going to look at each one of them in a short series of messages. And th the first one is today, the, uh, the message that I'm calling, All to Jesus I Surrender. We get insight into how Paul viewed his relationship with Jesus in his statement, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. So I want to give you the historical background uh, to what Paul was saying when he uses the term bondservant. Okay, some translations uh, translate the Greek word doulos, which is, that, that's the word that's used in the New Testament there in the Greek New Testament. Instead of translating it bondservant, they translate it servant. Servant is a correct translation, but for me, servant doesn't capture the nuance of the Greek word. Paul uses, that, that, that Paul uses in this passage of Scripture a servant works for wages. Earning money is the motive for their labor. You catch that? That's the one, one, of the, one of the few little differences between a bond servant and a servant in this context is a servant, well, I'm working for, I'm getting paid to, to do the work that I do. Now, slave is another way that this word can be translated. Indeed, some translations of the Bible use the word slave in this passage of Scripture, but like servant, Slave doesn't capture the meaning of the word bondservant because a slave is someone who's forced into servitude. They have no choice. You know, they live at the whim of their master regardless of how they feel about their circumstances. You know? And so to the Romans, when Paul was writing 
to the Romans, he used the, he used the Greek word doulos here because that's the, really the only word in the common language of the day that, that captured what the, part of the, the, the most important part of the essence of this term bondservant. But in the Hebrew, the word is ebed. And an abed is not a slave, nor is it a servant for hire. And we're going to talk about, we're going to take a look at what the Old Testament, how the Old Testament describes this bondservant so that we understand what Paul is saying about himself and how he sees his relationship to God as a bondservant to Jesus Christ. You know? Now we have to remember that Paul was a former Pharisee, right? Remember the Pharisees, the religious people in the Jewish uh, religion in the first century where, when Paul was alive? He was very well versed in the teaching of the law, the Old Testament law. And he also knew the prophets. He knew the writings. That's what encompasses what we call our Old Testament today, the law, the prophets, and the writings. He had access to all the commentaries of the day by famous and notable rabbis, such as his own mentor, Gamaliel. Do you remember in the book of Acts where, where Park, Paul talks about himself being a student of Gamaliel? This is a big deal. To this day, Gamaliel, that man who was Paul's mentor in the Jewish faith, is one of six rabbis who hold the title of Nasi, or prince, among the Jewish scholars. To this day, there's only six of them. Paul's mentor was one in the first century. 2,000 years ago. So Paul knew what a bondservant was. His understanding of bondservant and the way he used it, as I mentioned, comes from that Greek word abed. And it's found in Exodus and Deuteronomy. And I'm going to read to you um, the passages of Scripture. It, they're fairly lengthy, so I'm just going to kind of condense them and pull together with the essence of it. You can read them for yourself um, in their entirety. But Exodus 21, verse 2, and then verses 5 through 6, here's what the Lord says in the law. Now, this is, this is part of when God met Moses on the, the Mount Sinai and gave him the Ten Commandments, those Ten commands, Commandments are what got famous. There were 632 other commandments that we don't talk about very much because the, those, 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 the big ten are there, but there are 632 more. And this part of what we're going to read here is another, one of the, another set of those commandments that, Paul, that the Lord gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. He says this, If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year you shall, he shall go free without paying anything. Now here's the context, all right? I'm a wealthy Jewish landowner, and I'm very prosperous. And my poor neighbor Austin hit some hard times. His crops dry up, he doesn't farm well, you know, and, and he comes to me and he says, look, I'm in trouble. I can't feed my family. Um, I, I'm willing to indenture myself to you for, for six years if, so that you'll pay me, so that you will take care of me, take care of my family. And then at the end of the six years, I'm supposed to release him, and we're going to find out later, not only do I release him, but I'm supposed to set him up really well, give him a big chunk of money, some goods, whatever it takes to help him get back on his feet, Austin's going to be okay. Okay, now this is how, one of the ways that the Lord is taking care of people who hit hard times within the Jewish economy in that time. He's, this is a way to take care of them. They work for a living by indenturing themselves to somebody for about six years. And that's the context of this passage of Scripture. Then it goes on. But if the servant declares, I love my master, and my wife and children, they don't want to go, they don't want to go free, then his master may take him before the judges... He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he shall be his servant for life. So I take such good care of Austin and his family. He says, we got it really good. We don't want to go anywhere. I love you. I just want to serve you the rest of my life. We're okay just doing this. I, we go before the judges. He makes that declaration to them to make it's a legal thing. And then I take an awl. We go to the fence post by my house and I've pierced his right ear with his all. Now, one of the things that the Bible does not command that often the Jews would do is they would put a gold ring in that piercing. One, to make it permanent, and two, 
to, to stand as a symbol to the people around them that I am a bondservant. My ear's been pierced. Right? So that's, that's, th this is, so that's the whole idea behind what Paul is saying when he describes himself as a bondservant of Jesus. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 15, 12, and 16 through 17, it says this. And it kind of it just reinforces this a little bit. And this is, this, the context of this is Moses, before he's about to die, he's given his last speech to the nation of Israel. And this is coming out of that speech. And he's, he's re reviewing the law that God gave them back on Sinai. He says this, If a fellow Hebrew, a man or a woman, sells himself to you and serves for six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and your family is well off with you, then take an all, push it through his earlobe into the door, and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your maidservant. So whether it's a female or a male, uh, male slave, indentured slave, it, this, this principle applied. Okay? Though it's not required in the scriptures, very often, as I mentioned, the masters have put a gold ring in there, and this is what made that wound permanent and identified them as belonging to their master. It's just kind of a pretty cool thing when you think about it. Right? And this is one of the things that made the Jewish economy work under the Old Testament. Because people who hit hard times, they had recourse. But not, they didn't become permanent slaves. They worked for a living, and then after six years, they were able to... Um, rebuild their lives, but in those cases where they said, you know, I just like what I'm doing. I could do this the rest of my life. I'm all right with it. There was a way for them to become part of the master's household and, and make that relationship permanent. But it was always the relationship of a bondservant. You know, they were to live in service to this master for the rest of their lives. This is a covenant. And I want to talk about uh, the, the, the importance of this as being a covenant because this ceremony enacts a lifelong covenant between the master and the servant. It is a covenant that's made before God and the elders of the community. It's legally binding and cannot be nullified and only ends at death. There's, there's, no, there's no going back once you get your ear pierced. The decision to enact it, however, look at this, belongs to the servant. It's up to the servant to decide this is what they want to do. Do you catch that? It's not forced upon them. It's the servant who says, I want to, I want to be your servant the rest of my life. That's what I want to do. It is not forced servitude. It's motivated by love and a good experience with the master. You know, after six years of being with us, and Austin would be so in love with me and Cheryl as his... his, his his masters, that he just wants to be with us for the rest of his life. You know, look at him shaking his head, yeah. <laughs> so, you're all witnesses. <laughs> right? But it's, this, is, this whole thing, it's initiated by the servant, it's motivated by love and an experience with this master that, that, such that this person says, I just want this to be the rest of my life. You know? And it's a covenant that's made before witnesses. That going before the elders of the community was an important step in this because it defined, it defined this relationship for the whole community. Everybody knew who this, who this bondservant was and who this master was and what this relationship was about. I want to talk now a little bit about the elements of a covenant because, first of all, we have to understand that a covenant is not a contract. Sometimes you'll hear people kind of equate the two. They say, well, a covenant is basically like a contract. It's not anywhere close. A contract seeks to protect the rights and the interests of the parties who enter into the contract. Okay, so if I go into a contract, and I, as a business owner and, and the services I provide in, in my business, I have contracts with my clients. My clients know exactly what I'm going to do for them. They know exactly what I, what I expect from them. They know what they can expect from me. But the contract is designed to protect me as the business owner and to protect my client as my customer. Catch, catch that? That's not what the case is with a covenant. A covenant describes a relationship between parties, and that relationship 
is what the covenant protects. Okay? The covenant is about protecting the relationship, not the parties in the, in the contract. It's about the relationship. In the Old Testament, three elements had to be present to enact a covenant. There had to be blood. There had to be some sort of token that represented and remind people, reminded the people in the covenant of their relationship. And then there had to be an exchange of promises. Where have we seen that before? Marriage? Right? As a matter of fact, there are, there are five major covenants that, that we find in the Bible. Marriage is one of them. It's the first covenant. But the other ones are, another one is the Noahic covenant, the covenant that God entered into with humanity through Noah after the flood. Noah offered sacrifices. There's the blood. What was the token? The rainbow. What were the promises? I will never flood the earth again. With, I will never destroy the earth again with a flood. So all those three elements are present. Then there was the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that God entered into with Abraham. The Mosaic covenant, which we often call the Old Testament. That covenant was also enacted by blood. And there was a token. There was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside of that covenant were three things that stood as witnesses of the covenant. Aaron's rod that budded, a pot of manna, and the tablets of stone that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, Right? So there's the token and the promises. The whole book of Deuteronomy is a recitation of those promises. If God said that, that God's promise, I will protect you if you do your part. I will watch over you if you here's my part and here's what I expect of you. Here's your part. And it's all about the relationship that Yahweh had with the, with the nation of Israel under the Mosaic law. Then there was the Davidic covenant, the covenant that God entered into with David, saying, I'm going to establish your house forever. There will always be a ruler from your house before me. After David offered sacrifices when he became king. And then finally, the last covenant is the new covenant, or the New Testament, as we call it. There was blood, the blood of Jesus. What's the token? We have been sealed with whom? The Holy Spirit. He's the token of our relationship. And the promises, Matthew through Revelation, they're all right there. So these, these elements in, the, in this, this bondservant covenant that, that Paul claims himself to have entered into with Jesus, I am a bondservant to Jesus Christ, the piercing of the ear represented, it brought blood, and it represented death. The death of the, the, that person was giving up their future to connect themselves for the rest of their lives to this master. The ring and the doorpost were the tokens. The ring in the ear, the mark on the, the, the hole on the door, the, do, the uh, doorpost. The all was the accepting of the masters. That's the masters accepting the responsibility because it's not just that the person's getting a free slave. He owes it to protect this, this, this bond servant and his family, to provide for them, to make life good for them in the context of their service for him. And finally, the judges are the witness of the covenant, the witnesses of the covenant. Those are the, the elders of the community who saw that and were the witnesses that, okay, we, we see what this is and we honor this relationship. This social covenant that the Lord gave the Israelites is a picture of what it means to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I want to challenge us to go beyond being a redeemed people to becoming a church of bondservants. Okay. You catching me? Are you following me on that? We're saved. We're going to heaven when we die. But I want to encourage us, myself included, I want to be a bondservant to Jesus. I want my ear pierced. I actually have them pierced. They still had a hole in them there. I just don't put anything in them anymore. But, but I, I, that's the level I want to serve Jesus at. Totally in. I'm all in, Lord. My preferred future is the one you have for me. And we can say that at any age. This is not just for the young. It's not just for the old. At any place, when we in our relationship with Jesus have enough experience with him, that a true love grows for him, there's going to come a point where he's going to, where 
there's some, something is going to yearn inside us that we're going to go, we want to go a little further. And he's going to bring out an all. Say, are you ready? I'm going to pierce your ear. Right? Becoming a bondservant of Jesus is a decision that we make. It's your response to experiencing the love of God and his grace in your life. And you can only, it can only happen after you have a history with him. You can't expect this of somebody who's brand new in the Lord. They just, they're just getting started. But there's a point at which all of us are going to have an opportunity to go deeper in and higher up when it comes to our service to the Lord. Our very best can only be given to God after he pierces our ears. This, this piercing is symbolically what we're talking about here. It's, it represents the death of the flesh. It represents the death of what me and what I want and my selfishness and everything else and puts me in a place that says, God, whatever you have for me, I'm in. Whatever that is, I'll be a fig picker like Amos was, you know, if that's what you want for me, right? God calls us to die and to surrender and live a broken life, if you will, broken from our own selfishness, not broken in the sense that we're hurting, but broken in the sense that my will, it's not my will, it's your will, Lord, that matters. And those are times are the doorposts in our lives. We're going to have many of them. You know, Denny, I get, Brother Silliman, if I, make, I guarantee you, you've had, a, you've had your ear pierced. Just the, the little bit of, I mean, your wife doesn't know yet, but... Um, <laughs> But just, just the little bit I've gotten to know you that, and the, the things that God's called you to do that were challenges, you know, that made you go, well, Lord, I'm not sure I want to do this, but I love you enough that I will. Every time we face something like that and we say yes to Jesus, our ear gets pierced. We, it, 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 it brings us into some, a different kind of a relationship with him. God puts a ring in our ear and he marks us as his own. And I'm not talking about salvation here, so hear me on that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something different. He gives us power of attorney over his affairs and he expects us to be faithful stewards of his possessions. That's what Austin's job would be as a bondservant to make sure that the affairs of my household ran smoothly. Just like Joseph, remember Joseph in the Old Testament? When he was at Potiphar's house, right? He was put in charge of everything. That's what his job was as a, as a slave to Potiphar in Egypt. Right? Becoming God's bondservant brings his authority, his blessing, and his provision to carry out the tasks that he has for us. When we become bondservants and he calls us to do things, he's going to provide us with what we need to get the job done. Right? He doesn't leave us hanging. He's going to provide it. But we can't fake this. We can't avoid the pain of the piercing by simply buying a clip-on, right? You know, I wear it when, I, when it's fashionable, but when it starts to become inconvenient, I'm going to take that off. I don't want that hole in my ear. That hurts, right? There are two problems with this. The power of the flesh remains unbroken in, the lives of, in our lives when we just put a clip-on on. We need to be pierced. They live, they, they live with, we, we live with ourselves at the center of our lives. And this kind of goes back to my last week's message where we, we those are, the, when we, we, we put the clip on, on, we're really, what we're saying is Jesus is part of my life. He's not, we're not saying Jesus is my life. We're saying he's part of my life, an important part, but he's compartmentalized in this slice of the pie here. And there are some other slices of the pie that for me, that I do, my, that's where I live and Jesus is in this part. When Jesus says, no, nah, it's really not what I want. I want all of it. You know? And the second thing is the master's mark is not on him. The people can't see the ring. You don't stand out in the crowd as a bondservant. You know, there's, no covenant, there's no covenant of love that holds us to the master so that when time gets tough or the needs of the kingdom encroach upon our, our times and our needs, our and our resources, the commitment wanes. We can get a distorted view of what it means to be part of the master's household, kind of like these people. 
Imagine a church where every member is passionately, wholeheartedly, and recklessly calling the shots. I don't know who sets the worship center temperature, but why does it have to be so cold? Why do you have to be so right? Heated chairs are now being installed. This one wants a small church, but I'm afraid if it's too small, they're gonna make me volunteer like crazy. And I don't stack chairs, <laughs> do I? Makes total sense. Join now and we'll let you decide the size of our church. We're millennials and we want a church that- Say no more. Any requests you have will be granted immediately. <laughs> Parking is horrible. It takes me almost six minutes to get from my car to the building. Ugh. It's going to take me six seconds to tell you a valet service is on the way. My pastor's preaching, it's all over the map. I say, oh, I don't know, stick with the books of the Bible. We should be only exegetical. Okay, next week we start John chapter 1, verse 1. And we'll even start pronouncing that word the way you said it. Hey, I'd like this sermon to be no longer than 30 minutes. How does 15 minutes sound? Hey, anybody willing to go 15 should be willing to go to 10. <laughs> you drive a hard bargain. But from now on, five minute sermons it is. <laughs> now you're talking. Me Church, where it's all about you. Obviously a little, a little tongue in cheek. But the point's made. We are the master's children. We're bond servants. That's what he wants us to be. Our lives surrendered to him, sold out, whatever it is, God. You know. And as we close our service today, I just want to challenge you to, to get inside with the Lord. Just ask him, am I, am I your bond servant? Have I surrendered myself to you, not out of duty, but out of my love for you? Fill in the blanks like this. Your name, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be a mom, a dad, a teacher, a retiree, city worker, door elect doctor, electrician, correctional officer, whatever it is, you're called to be whatever God has you doing right now. You know, separated for the gospel of God. Is this your identity? Is this, is this, is this true of you? And this, this only you can answer. This is between you and the Lord. But I want to, I want to challenge all of us to get to the, just kind of groan a little. Lord, I want more. I want to be more of who you want me to be. And I want you to use me in this day, in this time, my, whatever, whatever station of life I'm in, use me, God, for your glory. Amen? I'm going to ask Shay and Paul is already. We're going to close with a song this morning. And, uh, Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you're, you're awesome. You deserve our absolute best, and you deserve 100% of who we are every minute of every day. And yet, God, we know that that's a challenge sometimes for us. Um, Lord, we still have very real and definite distractions and enemies who want to uh, just keep us from, Lord Jesus, just... Uh, becoming the people you want us to be, God, becoming uh, the, the kind of life-giving church that you have for us. And God, this isn't to criticize what we are, only to challenge us to not become complacent, Lord, to allow you to keep doing what you're doing in us. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we ask God now that you would just uh, touch every heart here in whatever way he or she needs, Father. In your precious name we pray, amen.